to the back of the I hope you show them back at the end. <laughs> okay, good evening, everybody. A very warm welcome. Um, apologies if you were held up with the traffic tonight. It was quite horrendous coming up from Bangor. And as usual, I have no idea why, but I sat for a quarter of an hour uh, on the old road. Anyway, that's what it's not like that in my own. So apologies uh, if anybody's caught. Okay, right here, I'm going to visit Mike. Has everybody got their, uh, their new sheet? If not, I'll turn it back. And, uh, thank you very much. And um, did we get the attendance? Uh, uh, sheet is there a sheet going around? Well, thank you. By the way, Paul is our new secretary. Just go look at the guy over here. So if anybody's any questions or anything else, Paul's, Paul's there. Um, he's happy to answer anything complicated. Uh, we're going to have uh, our usual time of talk, just in a moment or two, but also back this week, so we're just going to tell us what's happening in the sky. Um, and then uh, a little update observing, which I'll give now. Um, anybody who wasn't here last week will know that we sort of can't go to development anymore because we put a, a barrier down across the gate and we don't have the, uh, don't have the key to get in. So at the moment, we're observing from Danny Boy. And thanks to everybody that turned up a couple of weeks ago. We had a really good session and uh, we were fortunate with the clouds. It was probably the last thing we went during night, actually, um, if you've been looking for this comment, uh, a few, few and far between. And then we're delighted to be able to welcome um, one of our, our best, I think, best local speakers, uh, Dr. Mike Sims. And uh, we'll speak to Mike in a moment or two. And he'll be talking about the Witch School, either right, his part in Southfall. But without any further ado, and the notice there, he's not here tonight, so things will be a lot easier. Oh dear? That's not good. Can you see the screen? It's the wrong thing. Okay, so uh, it's uh, brilliant. Um, we're sort of well into winter, and we're going to have a look at some of the things that are going on uh, in the sky during February, in which today is the first, so that's a good place to start. And, um, so, usual, we have to look at the sun. Now, the sun recently has been very, very active. Um, a week or two ago, there were some really quite big spots on the sun. Uh, and for the moment, that seems to walk all away again. And there are just five sunspot groups on the sun at the moment, and all quite small and insignificant. Um, however, we are the current uh, total of spotless days in 2023 for the whole of January so far is none. And there was only one day, which I think was about the 8th of June, last year, wasn't it? So we went into the activity, in the active cycle uh, of uh, solar cycle 25. And if you look at the, uh, you look down the numbers, uh, you can see that uh, we were last here about sort of 2012. Uh, and so that, that's when the, uh, the auroras kicked off there. And uh, we got some very good auroras during cycle 24. Um, this is the predictions for how cycle 25 may go. And what's really being said here at the, at the end of this, at the top there, um, is that cycle 25 was initially predicted to be not that active, um, 24 wasn't either, um, but actually now it's looking like 25 is getting off to a faster start than, than had previously been thought, and um, it might be better than 24, the last one. Uh, whether it will be up there with the, the previous three, 21, 22 and 23, were all very, very active solar cycles. Uh, whether we get back to that uh, sort of level remains to be seen, but uh, about three years time, two to three years time, we should be looking at quite regular bright auroras visible this far south. Uh, this is the sort of thing, um, that, um, that's, that's where I live, up the coast, Ballygally. Um, that was actually in March 2016, that was uh, uh, taken from the Valley Gally Bear, which uh, you can see here, which is a little bit of rock that uh, uh, has, has for years, I don't know how many years I've been here that long, but uh, uh, that's had that face painted on it, it's quite famous. Right, and it's a lovely car park that looks directly north, uh, with no lights until you get past the Malkin tyre. So that's uh, something to look forward to, and it's beginning to happen. Now there is a thing, um, I've talked about this before, if you think of the Russell McFerrin effect, and all you really need to know about it is that the um, magnetic field um, that pulls the solar particles into the upper atmosphere 
uh, is best aligned with the sun at the equinoxes of March and September. So we're coming up towards March, so let's say hopefully we should see some good auroras uh, in, in weeks and months to come. Now then, the lunar phase is always important for observing. Now, you don't see very dark objects much around the full moon, so you need to know when that is. Actually, it's this Saturday. Um, so that wouldn't be a good night to go out observing if you were looking for faint galaxies and stuff. Um, the new moon is the 19th. Now, the way this works, I'll just explain how this works for, for observing. Now, when the moon starts to get into this sort of, uh, this waning phase here, not only is there less moonlight, but also the moon rises later. So you do get, um, an increasing amount of time in the evening when there is no moon in the sky until it comes up. So when you're onto your, your third quarter moon here, around about the, uh, um, the 19th or so, sorry, the 12th, um, then what happens there is that um, the, the moon only comes up at midnight, so your evening is actually moon free. So you do get quite a good chance to see uh, dark skies and hopefully sometimes even dark clear skies. Uh, that seems to be the biggest problem at the moment. Um, so we'll have a look at what's going on. This is just after sunset. In fact, this is tomorrow, um, second, 6 p.m. in the evening. And we've got a nice line of bright planets across the sky, uh, Venus, Jupiter, and Mars. Uh, now, we've pretty much, we've pretty much lost Saturn at this point. Saturn has been visible for a few months, and uh, is now going behind the sun. Uh, mostly, that's our movement rather than its that's creating that situation. Um, but Saturn is now really close to the sun, um, and you won't see it now. Uh, Venus, on the other hand, is coming up and getting brighter. And the thing to watch with Venus over the coming months is it's currently sort of the other side of the sun from us. Um, so it's, it's, it's well lit, um, and it looks almost brown through the telescope. But actually, as it comes towards us, it will get bigger and form a crescent, like a sort of mini moon. So uh, that's something to watch with Venus. Um, there are other planets. Uh, not far from Venus, there is Neptune. There, and Uranus is up here towards, um, towards Taurus. I'll just have a, a look at Neptune in a moment. I'll have a little bit of a look there. This is, uh, yeah, this is, this is the, now what's the date here? The date here is the 14th, Valentine's Day, as I would have it. There is a close conjunction between Venus and Neptune, in which they are less than one half, um, minute apart. That is to say, two moon widths. So, uh, sorry, one degree, not, not, not half. Okay. So, so, so that is two moon widths between Venus and Neptune. And what that enables you to do um, is to be able to find Neptune because you know where it is. Um, and that's usually one of the triggers. So if you cannot see it, it's magnitude 7.8 or thereabouts. Um, so it's two magnitudes dimmer than you, you need it to be for naked eye vision. Um, but uh, you will be able to find it in a pair of binoculars or a small telescope next to the units, assuming that the sky is clear enough. If, if the sky is a bit hazy, you'll see Venus, but it will have a glare around it that will engulf Neptune, unfortunately. So, uh, so that's a good opportunity to see Neptune if it's clear on Valentine's Day and you're not doing anything else. Um, another conjunction comes up later in the month, or actually the 1st of March, as it's said it's, it's uh, very best, and that is that uh, the two brightest planets, Jupiter and Venus, will appear right next to each other, um, less than a degree apart. In fact, it's just, just, over, just over one moon diameter apart, so a very close conjunction as those two planets pass each other in the sky, Venus going up, Jupiter going down. So that's, uh, that's a bit of planets. Um, something else that you can see quite well at the moment, this is a bit of a, a bit of star hopping. And what you need to do, it's quite easy to see, it's quite obvious in a clear sky, is find the great square of Pegasus, which is these four bright stars, of course. distance in your head, and then come along to the top left star there, and 
take a slight right turn and go the same distance again to the other right side, which is called Merak. And you saw the Merak with a sharp right turn, go a short way, where you see a dim little star there called Blue End Property. And then you go the same distance again, and there is this fuzzy patch there. Uh, it is on the slide, can you see it? From there, I, I, I can't from here, because I'm too, no doubt. But that there is the Andromeda Galaxy, and that is um, what it looks like. Uh, that's actually quite a, a long exposure photograph that I, I took that with an ordinary camera um, attached to a, to a six inch reflector, um, which is several, um, several exposures. Oh, sorry, I've had a lie. That's not with a with telescope at all. That's with a 135 mm f2.8 lens um, on the camera, and it's a tracking mount, um, and uh, quite a lot of processing goes into getting all that out of it. But uh, that was, that was taken from an arm. Now then, my other bit of star hopping. Uh, oh, oh, right, yes. All right, so we're looking south in the evening now, and um, towards the right end. Now we've got the uh, Jones right, or three stars of the right belt. And you can use the right end as a signpost. And if you follow the three stars of the belt downwards, you come to a very bright star, indeed the brightest star in the sky, which is Sirius. Um, and that's high enough up, and you find that Sirius just twinkles away. Um, and if you film it, it comes out with different colours. Uh, right. And that's, that's not to do with Sirius, that's to do with the amount of air you're looking through. Um, so, and if you go upwards from the three stars of the belt, you come to Aldebaran, um, Taurus Bull here. And also Mars happens to be in that area. Isn't it? Why, why? I think it's because I'm slightly touching on the arrow buttons with the laser button. Right, so, uh, so here we have Taurus Ball. That green shape is the Hyades cluster, of which Aldebaran is not actually a member, it's just in the same direction, not as far away. Um, then a bit further up, we've got the Seven Sisters up here, and you can play the game of uh, counting the Seven Sisters. Um, you might think that's the easiest game in the world, but actually, different people see different numbers. Uh, I see six, because my eyesight's not. Fantastic. Um, in Japan, um, they call that Subaru. And if you look on the front of a Subaru car, there's a badge with six stars on it. So I'm assuming here that Mr. Subaru is, uh, is similarly afflicted to me, he doesn't have very good eyesight, you can only count six. Uh, I do know someone who can see 13, but that's very exceptional. If you look through a telescope, there's over 100. So so that's um, starting at Orion. This is Orion itself. It's always, it's always worth a look at Orion because um, two main stars of Orion here. Uh, right or down the bottom. Right or means foot. So that's what that's about. And, and both of those up here. Um, and you can see on this slide, and you can see in real life too, that they are quite strikingly different colours. Um, right or is a very bright blue star. Both of those is a red giant. And both of those is really quite variable. A couple of years ago, it actually lost about one and a half magnitudes of brightness. Just, um, they think, the, the latest theory is that it was just a dust cloud went in front of it, um, which is a bit, a bit of a shame because many people are waiting for it to explode because it is an unstable star and you know, could suddenly become as bright as a full moon in the sky um, if, it, if it does actually explode. But of course, although that will happen eventually in a time that is quite short by celestial standards. I'm afraid in terms of human lifetimes, the chances of anyone here actually seeing it are quite slim, but it will happen one day. So keep having a look at those which let's go. Is it brighter than right or maybe? Um, I just threw this in, I think everyone knows this, but at this moment finding the North Star is quite a useful thing to be able to do as we'll see. This is um, at this time of year, the orientation of the now is, is, a, is sort of such as sort of on its side. Here. So, so here's the handle of the plow and then four stars of the bucket. Now the two point of stars they point up to the um, And that's useful at the minute just to be able to do that because that's your starting point for the next bit of observation, which is the comet that everyone's been talking about. Um, I think people have been talking about it more than people have been actually seeing it, but uh, 
because um, it is one of those that um, was sort of liked up a bit as comments tend to be. Um, but it's not really all that bright. Some say it's just about naked eye visible now. But uh, to go back to what I was saying about finding north, because um, here we are up the top here. Um, this is Stellarium, by the way, but it's not my Stellarium. Um, and the person who did this uh, is obviously German. <laughs> because the star names are a bit different. But up here, around, this is where we are today, the first, you see this? So here's your, uh, here's your plow. Wherever it is. Yeah, here's your plow, and here's your line up. So all the star there, and uh, just to the left of that now is where we are, and it is heading off further to the east of such a line, and it comes down towards the bright star propeller, and another 6th of February. So if you do get the clear night, that's a good guide to, uh, to be able to find the comet. Uh, if you start taking photographs up to the wide angle lens, you're looking for the bit that's green. They say, they're they calling this the great green comet, and I thought all comets were green, but this one seems to be exceptional. So. Um, and it has been out, um, and it's observed too, it's got a couple of cracking pictures of it. Um, and uh, you see the exceptional green colour there. This is the 26th of January, and I, I suppose the other one was, was more or less the same, was it? That's sort of time. So, uh, that's quite a lot of telescope images stacked up. And Andy's managed to do it so that the stars move and the comet stays still, which is clever stuff indeed. Um, so that's really all I have to say for the time being. Uh, other than say, say, keep looking up. Thank you very much. As I say, um, one of the Good Friends Association, uh, Dr. Max Sims, who's the senior cur curator of geology at National Museums Northern Ireland. Um, and Mike, despite his youthful appearance, has been a geologist for 55 years, um, since the age of six, when he discovered fossils. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Mike. So, so uh, Yes. So, uh, quite often I don't bother to sort of suggest that I give a talk to the, the, the star men, as I call it, or star people. Um, because I know at some point, probably every year or two, Terry will contact me and say, Mike, Mike, I'll speak with Paul there, can you give a talk? And I think, oh, well, I think I have about eight or nine days uh, for this one. And anyway, so we might not be as polished as some. Anyway, so the Witcher Meet Guys, um, 25th of February 2021. My part is down for, apologies to Spike Milligan for that. Okay, we go back to the beginning, uh, August 1967. I found some fossils in that garden in Gloucestershire, where we come from, uh, and a fossil obsession began. And I was obsessed with fossils ever yeah, since, you see. And these pictures of me when I'm about eight or, eight or nine up on the hill, just behind the house key hill, high point of fossils. And this is a bee, this is my autobiography when I was nearly nine. And the thing to, to note, I was interested in all sorts of things. Uh, well, that's me. My hobbies are. Fossils first of all, blah blah blah, astronomy, astronomy is in there, you see. Uh, and then also, I'm nearly nine, but look, my height is 3 foot 11 inches, I weigh 3 stone 9 pounds. I think that's malnourished these days in the past, there. But also, the thing is, I live in the middle of Bishop's Clean in Chapman. That will be some forgiven. When I grow up, I want to be a geologist. And I am a geologist. But whether I've grown up or not, it remains open to things. Anyway. Okay, astronomical influences. Uh, really, there's this three. This is my my dad, who, uh, this is in North Africa, he was in the Egg Army, and he was very interested in astronomy as a kid. So, I mean, he was, he was in the war, he was age 19, you know, so it's quite a formative experience. And the officers in charge, so there was a basic trip ship which took them down from Southampton down to, to North Africa, so he was on this trip ship for about a week or more. And the officers realised that he knew, he taught himself a lot about astronomy and the stars and things like that. And said, so you can talk to the guys to stop them getting bored. You see, now most of the scholars did not want to hear about astronomy, but my dad had a captive audience, you see, because the officers sort of insisted, no, you listen to him. So anyway, so my dad loved it, he loved it, anyway. And he was very interested in astronomy, he was very interested in cosmology and the big questions, you know, about black holes and the origin of the universe, and is it an expanding universe, or is it going to shrink and so on and so forth. So he was, you know, he, 
that was influenced by him. Then the second thing was this book, which we know in a bookcase, The Story of the Heavens by Sir, what was his name? Well, Sir Lord. Uh, and of course, it's a very out of date book. It's something like 1885. So a lot of the, the things in it are kind of pretty outdated concepts. But there was some, there was enough there to sort of really get me interested. And also, as we can even go, I used to press leaves in it in autumn. But anyway, and then of course, the third thing, this is the. Uh, um, David Bowie, 1972, Starman, on top of the pops. That iconic, anybody who's old enough to remember that, that was an amazing moment. And, that was the same time that I discovered the Percy and Meteor. I think people have known that before, but I discovered the Percy and the Percy and Meteor shower. Uh, and I used to get up in the middle of the night, uh, well, past one, two o'clock in the morning, and I'd put on my dressing gown and my slippers, and I'd go wandering around the streets, because it was just a small village, so I think I'd be, well, my parents would be interested now, because I was looking at them at the time. So David Bowie as well was, uh, was perhaps an influence. But then I knew a little bit about meteorites, I knew that they came from outer space, and I thought that they all were sort of lumps of metal. And when I was actually about, about nine, I thought I'd found a meteorite by the side of the road, about a mile from where we grew up, and I dragged my dad along to look at it and said, No, that's just a weather lump of limestone. My first meteorite. But 25th of March, 2003, this is my mum and dad, uh, a place called Bolton on the Water, which is a very broccoli sort of village in, in the Cotswolds, and I used to take them for lunch there, you see, and there's a shop. Here, called the Lodestone, which sells rocks and minerals and things like that. You see, of course, I have to look here. And on the counter, he has some things that were obviously meteorites. And I thought, oh my goodness, you know, where did he get those from? And then he opened his mouth and expected to see if he could eat some. You see, he picked them up himself in, in the Libyan. You see, these are Libyan meteorites. And they seemed quite cheap. Um, so I can't say, I. My wife Alison was back at home, and there was one website I knew about the Sodomy Trust, so I said, I said, look at I said, yeah, go and look at the website, tell me how much they're asking for Gillian Meteorites per gram. And that website was asking about four times what this guy was selling before. I thought, oh, right, I'll go back. So I intended just to buy this little one here. But once you've got over that hurdle of parting with cash, you think, oh, what the this? Uh, and that one too, uh, oh no, not that one, that, that one there. All oh, those slices, and that little one. And then he took me to his lockup, where that was even bigger, that's about 2.7 kilograms or something like that. And he had a good holiday that year. No. Uh, but the thing was, that these were iron meteorites, and I sort of thought, well, meteorites are iron meteorites. But what he did was he threw in this particular slice there, which is uh, from the same area as these Gideon meteorites they're called from Namibia. It's a stony meteorite, it's a chondrite, and I knew nothing about that it was at all. But I wanted to find out more. So you start searching on the news and you think, oh my god, there's this whole world of stuff I do not know about that I must find out more about. And that became an obsession, an all-consuming obsession. So sort of buying books and looking up as much as I could about some meteorites. So that's where it began. So it's nearly 20 years ago. Uh, Month, actually. Yes, yeah, so meteorite obsession begins and so it goes on. We go back to some of the basics meteor and meteorite. A meteor is the flash of light that you see streaking across the sky. And the way to remember is the, the gloss of meteor, which is the first light of jet which streaks across the sky. If it crashes and goes thud, it will be the gloss of meteorites. Meteorites are the things that actually can hit the ground and go thud. So that's the easy. No, um, the BBC will get this wrong. Um, the, the news reporters or whatever. Okay, so we're going to February the 28th. What time was it? It was 9.54 in the evening. I didn't see this, unfortunately. There was uh, one or two reports from uh, Northern Ireland of this amazing sort of fireball, really, really sort of brilliant fireball, and just streaking across the sky. It was caught on lots of cameras. More than a thousand people reported it. It holds the record for a number of people actually reporting the thing uh, all over. And so this is just the little map of the distribution. You see these people are looking northwards, these people, you see their eyes, they're looking southwards, and that's... Who is that? I can't remember his name. Anyway, he reports it, and he's got over here as well, you see somebody looking there. So something is happening in this sort of area. Of course, there's lots, there's... A uh, meteor camera network, which has actually increased quite considerably since this event, because this was such a significant event and the results were so good. I guess you can submit. 
So from these various types of meteor cameras around the place, the thing called the, the UK Meteor Network, which um, basically collate a lot of the information, and they are able to triangulate from uh, enough camera sightings to sort of triangulate really pretty precisely where this, where, where this thing is coming from and um, where it was going, what its trajectory was, which is unusual because it's a clear sky as well, so you've got really good coverage. And so I saw so why have we got these smaller bits either side of that main trajectory? And it's because the, the bigger bits, they have more momentum, and so they go further, and they go in the sort of straight lines. The smaller bits can be influenced by wind as they're falling probably 20 kilometers or more through the atmosphere. They can get buffeted around, because they're only little bits, and the stuff is not very dense. They're not dense, they're a little over to do. Um, and uh, so this is, uh, you've got the, the luminous bit here, which going from, yes, it's, it's actually, for this particular one is about 90 kilometers up, and it finished at about 27 kilometers up. Uh, and then the wind can do that, and we actually know what the wind speed was doing in the wind direction up here. So it's not, it wasn't the gale force wind, but it's probably enough to buffet those small bits around, so they end up uh, off the main trajectory, so, which was most annoying. Okay, well I did eventually get a piece. Chris Casey, who has his cotton stocks, he sent me a piece of it. 0.139 grams. Here it is. Oh, it was fantastic sort of thing. Uh, and he found it just here. This is where that photograph was taken next to my sister's old school just house. And you know, a spitting distance from it. And I lived here for much of my early life. I went to school there. My mum lives there. And this is what... Um, Chris said, he said, you know, I can only finally get these, you know, I was it, I am just the middleman. And then I got an arrival safe and you're happy with it. The universe is balanced, you know, is that it, it's not often that a meteorite kind of enthusiast is an expert. I had a meteorite falling on the home bridge, so um, I think it's very good if you said that. Okay, so we're going to have a bit of science, enough of this frivolous stuff. Um, what type is the Wichita meteorites? Hands up, no, 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 no. There's lots and lots of different sorts, iron meteorites, big conglites, stony ions, conglites, and such like. Well, it's what's called a carbonaceous conglite. And, and as soon as we saw those pictures of this, it was immediately obvious it's a carbonaceous conglite. And it's actually pretty sure what type of carbonaceous conglite is. It's all black. A lot of stony meteorites are pale on the inside, just black on the outside of the earth. Carbonaceous conglite is pretty rare. About 5% of all meteorite falls. Um, which is about 1,200 in total that we have uh, documented. Uh, that's not because they're rare in space. They're probably the most common type in space, but they're really crumbly, the slightest, flakiest, crumbliest meteorite, and so they struggle to get down through our atmosphere. And so one of the reasons that this one got down is, uh, is because it's going very slow. Uh, and it's a CM carbonation compound. There's lots of different sort of COCK, CB, CR. CM. And this is not transport for London, this is the terrestrial fractionation line. So Earth and the Moon and things like that sit on that, what to do with some isotopes, and these are a little bit off it. And that's telling us something about the early solar system. It's a whole group that are all sort of a bit just kind of converted to TFL. What are the main components? Well, this is a uh, cross section, so we're looking at them with a sort of iron microprobe thing, it's kind of colour coded. There's it's, it's obviously this meteorite has been kind of quite bashed about over the billions of years it's been out there. So things are kind of all mixed up and mashed up. Phyllosilicates, that means just clay. It's clay. It's a meteorite made of clay, and you wonder it doesn't get through. Then tocilonite, constantine, integrates. I had to look at myself actually. What the hell are they? Anyway, it's all to do with alteration of clay minerals by water. Um, so these are kind of watery meteorites, and then carbonates, um, which are the blue bits, and olivine, which is a common mineral, is, is what I've made. Uh, then this was a paper that was produced uh, by all the Naturalist Museum, uh, everybody had their dog. You see, there was a real box of the bombs, back in bombs, that's just a sudden picture of a bomb, so on and so forth. Anyway, everybody, everybody's on the I'm not quite useful. Um, so what do we get from this analysis of the meteorite? Well, we got all these cameras which not only told us where the thing might have come down, told us where to look, but it also told us 
where it came from. And uh, uh, essentially, here's the Earth, and of course it's hit the Earth, but it's always going out towards Jupiter. So it's out in the asteroid belt, which is what we expect, would expect. But when we compare it with other um, similar carbonaceous compounds from which we have similar sort of detailed trajectories, it's actually pretty similar. They're in the sort of outer part of the, the asteroid belt. Uh, what data can we get from the analyzing the meteorite there was, or the meteor? There was so much good footage of it, not just from the, the pop-up meteor cameras, but there was all doorbells and things like that. Doorbell cameras, it would have thought doorbell cameras. So entry velocity 13 and a half kilometers per second uh, when it first became luminous, about 90 kilometers. That is ever so slow, really, really slow. The Chinese meteorites um, from 20. 13 was doing nearly 20 kilometers a second. So this is very, very slow, which is one of the reasons it actually survived. It was very slow, and also it was coming in relatively steeply, so it didn't get completely annihilated. Um, final velocity, about three kilometers a second before it kind of actually switched off and went into dark flight. It wasn't going fast enough to eat the air over And the initial mass, when it first hit the atmosphere, was probably only about 13 plus or minus 3 kilograms. So not very big at all. About maybe the size of a football, something like that. Um, yeah, about one two of diameter. A small football, a big football. No, no, not, not, not very big. So I have a small grapefruit. No, big grapefruit. Small melon. I don't know, really. Not very big. Quite a small thing. So we're amazingly lucky if any of it has actually survived to Earth at all. The recovered mass. Is these are sort of various bits. These, this is uh, this is the stuff as collected by the Wilcox Moss from outer space. There's a really good program on tonight on BBC Four about mosses. I have heard of this. I've got some video machines. Anyway, so these are bits that they picked up off their driveways. See, that's the that's the biggest mass, about 250 grams. This is it all collated at the Natural Museum, or some of it. There's a little bit more further off the table. Each bit individually weighed and packed up and sealed. And then it's been uh, basically stored in an atmosphere of, of dry nitrogen so as to not interfere with its chemical level. And these are the various bits uh, that Chris Casey found. These were the bits that he was selling. He was selling little tiny chips because he found some quite decent sized bits, you know, all sized bits. But he also, some of them got some broken up. One of them got broken up by a car. Um, so a little small bits, which is one of the bits he gave me. So about 650 grams in total, which is about 5% of the total original mass. Uh, the Natural History Museum, the paper stuff says, oh, we think we found everything. You think, no, you haven't, because there's lots and lots of fields and things that you will not. I would say that probably two or three times this amount uh, came down altogether. So we missed probably at least the uh, same amount here. How long was it out there? How long did it take to get here from the, uh, from the asteroid belt? Uh, what we do is use cosmogenic exposed ranges. So basically, cosmic rays, which get very, very high energy particles, they zing into the, 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 the rock or whatever, and they will change sodium, amongst other things, they will change sodium 23 atoms, change to neon 21. So the longer it's out there in space, the more neon 21. And other uh, elements as well, there's aluminium 26, carbon 14, even. There's a whole plethora of these cosmogenic nuclei which help to tell us how long it has actually been in there. Uh, I have them. And these are the uh, cosmic ray exposure ranges for the sea and rock Earth generally, and they're mostly quite, yeah, you know, 2 million years or less. Compared with iron meteorites, if you look at iron meteorites, you're talking 500 million to a billion years. They've been floating around in space, being bombarded by cosmic rays. It's because these things are fragile. As soon as it crunches something else, they get all over the place. So this one is uh, about three, point three million years, three hundred thousand years, and that strongly suggests that the event that sent it our way is also the event that broke it into a small bit. So it's been sort of boom, and off it's gone, and it's taken three hundred thousand years to actually get here. Another thing we can get from these cosmogenic nuclei is you can estimate the original mass. Remember, we estimated the original mass from a meteor, just looking at that, and they figured it was 13 plus or minus 3 kilograms. From the cosmogenic nuclides, you, what you do is you look at the differences, 
because the, the center of this is not going to be effective. But in the outer one meter is effective. The further in you go, the less effective it is. So what you do, look, you look for differences in, in different samples. And if they all look pretty much the same, it gives you an idea of how big the thing was. And let's make 30 plus or minus 10 kilograms, maybe 30 to 40 centimeters across. So it's similar sort of you know, ballpark figure. It was not a big lump of rock. Um, and it's very friendly, we're very lucky to get these ones. Which came out of land water. We were very fortunate. It didn't rain all the time I was in Wichita. It did not rain. Uh, and it didn't rain for the first few days after the fall, which was very important for the ones that found the driveway so they were not contaminated by terrestrial water. Because the thing is, it's active space. It's got quite a bit of water in it. It's got about 12% water in it, the Wichita Beach right. Uh, and outer space is fine, but as soon as it lands on Earth, it's basically sucking in moisture from all around it. But the Wilcox, they managed to bag it all up and, and effectively seal it off. So it's really quite some pristine. And what you, you're looking at, you're looking at lighter water and heavier water, it's the deuterium hydrogen ratio, hydrogen 1, hydrogen 2, as it were. And there's lots of discussions where does the water on Earth come from? Uh, you know, is it uh, long period or cloud comets? No. Short period comets, maybe, but they may well be related to some of these carbonaceous comets. Giant planets, no. Um, whatever. Carbonaceous pomphorite meteorites, and that's where a witch can be tried. Basically, the water in the witch can be tried is, is very, very similar to the water on Earth. And in fact, this, this is uh, the thing I stumbled into this book. This is the world's water. This is all the water on Earth, according to one problem. Not very much. This is all the fresh water. This is all the liquid fresh water. Not very much of it. And it says if the final half percent of Earth's mass that the creatures is made of the same sort of stuff as the Olympic Meteor, of CM carbonaceous compromise, then it can account for all of the world's water. Well, we know that sort of CM compromise and their cousins, the CI compromise. Established compromise, they are the most common out in space. So they're the ones that you know, big chunks would have been bombarding Earth early on in the sort of Earth's history. And so almost certainly that's where a lot of the water came from. So which is very important because it's the least contaminated of all of the carbonaceous compromise we have. So shortly going to that asteroid that they went to, Ryan, 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 the one beginning with that. Anyway, short of doing that, it's quite expensive. Just get a bit of winter tells you that our water came from carbonation compounds. What else? Well, it's got the ingredients for life, uh, lots of amino acids and things like that, lots of, lots of chemicals with very long names, and naphthalene here, which is mothballs, of course. So you're not in trouble with mothballs with these sort of meteorites. This is, again, this is something that we knew about the CM compounds as they contain a lot of amino acids, but each of them contains slightly different proportions and, and different amino acids. And you can see Dozens and dozens, you know, there's loads and loads of them. Yeah, so there's windshields and loads. Windshields, but then they can pair it with soil from the same place just to make sure it's not contamination. So where's the windshield of our dog? That's the soil from the little fox car, let's be sure. Um, okay, so moving on to meteorites in general, but I'm uh, coming back to the carbonate products in general. Some meteorites are fragments of what we call differentiated planetismals in that they, they've melted completely and the dense stuff has gone towards the center and the gravity and the lighter stuff has gone to the surface like it on Earth. And you end up with uh, a metal core, a mantle made of aluminium and a crust made of aluminium and silicate and things like that. So we've got crusty, crystallized silicate meteorites from the crust, iron meteorites from the core, and things sort of in between. So these are what's called the differentiated meteorites, but they're actually a minority of uh, meteorites. So this all happened in the first few million years. Uh, in others, which is most of them, these are the combines, those different sort of elements weren't differentiated. Everything could have remained more or less sort of mixed up evenly. So if you took a bulk sample of this and analyzed it, it will just be the bulk elemental uh, uh, composition of the, the solar system, not sort of, sort of uh, concentrating any one particular element. And so you actually end up with differentiated meteorites, iron, a which are the ones of the crust, 
understand the eyes, which are the ones from the sort of between, and another group, and differentiated B factors. So all these chondrites, these are all the carbonaceous ones, these are the rooty root chondrites, and there are uh, all these other ones. Don't worry about all those. Uh, just to make the point that there's differentiated meteorites that have been processed, so certain elements have been removed elsewhere, and undifferentiated ones where it's still the original solar system composition. And then we look at the um, carbonaceous chondrites, and they're rich in carbon and water, mostly rich in carbon and water, some of them are not. Um, Formed from icy dust, we, we can tell that they've uh, been affected by water, which almost certainly is ice being melted earlier on in the solar system. There's been enough heat uh, to, to melt the ice. Uh, but they come from sea type asteroids, they're very dark, very bright sort of things. And then non carbonaceous chondrites, which is this gelatin, of course, very little carbon and water. <coughs> they form from dry dust, they tend to be really quite hydrous. They come from S type asteroids, which are brighter than gelatin as well. So you've got these two different sorts of chondrites. So this has been known for a long, long time, two distinct fields. And we can plot those when you do anomalous types. Uh, there's it's very interesting, you've got the carbonaceous chondrites up here, and there's some carbonaceous A chondrites there as well. And then there's uh, non carbonaceous ones up here. This is the called the Warren gap, named after a guy called Paul Warren, who had been doing a lot of work on isotopes, and he kept coming kind of across, he thought, oh, what's going on here? So, really, really important. This is 2011, so it was 13, 14 years ago he came across this, but it's changed the way we think about uh, meteorite formation and such like. Because when you look at iron meteorites, you think, well, iron meteorites are completely different. They're exactly the same thing. Non carbonaceous iron meteorites, carbonaceous iron meteorites. So there's a distinct group now. This Warren gap is just as prevalent. All of the meteorites, every meteorite you'll come across is either one of these or one of those. There's these two very, very distinct populations, and never the twain uh, shall meet. So suddenly it becomes really kind of quite interesting that we've got. It's, we've got two separate populations of meteorites on this. Oh, but this is, this is a classification, because you know, how do you classify them? It used to be easy. Iron, stony iron, uh, stony meteorites. And anyway, so this is my own classification. You know, you've got non You effectively have to create two class parallel classification schemes. One for carbonaceous, one for, one for non carbonaceous, one for carbonaceous. So, how did this all happen? Well, you go right back to the very beginning, time after solar system formation. This was the sign you've got non-carbonaceous iron cores are forming. They form within a million years or so of the solar system forming. These planetary cores melt, uh, iron goes towards the cores, and we get these dates that are, you know, a million years or less from the start of the solar system. Uh, then Jupiter starts forming. Jupiter grows very, very, sort of big, very, very quickly. Gets to sort of you know, 20 Earth masses within a million and a half years. Um, but that separates. Uh, that stops things that are forming outside. You've got planetesimals melting out there. And these are carbonaceous chondrite iron cores forming. But Jupiter stops them getting in. So you've got two distinct separate populations. And these are slower to form than these because they're going to melt all that ice before they can melt the rest. And then you've got the uh, non carbonaceous chondrite planets forming and the carbonaceous chondrite planets forming, and they're forming and they're separate and things separated by, uh, by Jupiter. And then there's a, a bit of a chaotic, and this is only three, four million years after the solar system. And then, not that long after that, you've got Jupiter's got really, really big, and it's moving out of the solar system, it's causing chaos, and it's flinging all, everything all over the place, and all hell breaks loose. So you get stuff from the outer solar system. Flung inwards and stuff, and the solar system flung outwards, and everything gets mixed up and ends up, the remnants of that end up in the asteroid belt. So the asteroid belt is effectively it's a cosmic refugee camp. And then you've got bits from the outer solar system flung inwards, bits from the inner solar system flung outwards, and sort of mixed together. And so even though they're all in the asteroid belt, they didn't start there, they started from different places, and those isotopes and those two distinct populations are telling you there were two distinct. Populations separated by Jupiter. Okay, I'll just finish on 2021 <coughs> exciting year. So there was the meteorite that fell on my village. I didn't find any myself, but I did end up with these. This was the 14th of uh, December 2021. I was sitting at home, and all of a sudden there was a bang, and the roof shook. And it was unlike anything I could experience. I was like, oh my god, what is going on? And I sent a, a WhatsApp message to, to my, my wife. This is the nurses at 9A. This is, we live at 9A. 
That's a theory. So, did you just hear about a meteor crash that just shook the house in 1747? I asked some old Paris Tartar, oh, no, she lived here for 30 no, years, and nobody did not understand anymore like the meteor. Of course, it wasn't. And a few days later, uh, there was uh, things in the Belfast Paper States of the Bible, and then this turned up on that uh, UK Monster website show. There was a major event that went actually across, and it was seen by uh, 80 or 83 people saw it, but unfortunately, all there's no footage, so nobody couldn't do it objectively. Land is somewhere in the So I did actually hear it. So not only did the meteorite fall on my village, but a, a meteorite sonic boom shook the roof of my house, which was very exciting. And interestingly, it coincides with Geminids. So is that when Geminids are the Geminids, could they be more uh, solid or not? Anyway. Um, oh, this is just an article, an article of what I wrote. Uh, there's a blog on the uh, Arsenal Museum website all about my thoughts uh, looking for the Witch Can Be Dry. If you can find it, you can find it. You can use it myself these days. Anyway, so I wrote this article as well, and also this, this magazine called Johnny Did Say, uh, Meteorite Special Issue, and basically I wrote all of it. I don't intend to, just in the like that. Anyway, so I just sent PDFs if anybody wants to read about any of these things. Um, Right, I think I'll finish there. Thank you very much.